Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a huge pleasure to be here at the second Paris Peace Forum, and indeed, to welcome you all to this session, which is called Handle with Care, Local Governance, Conflict Prevention in Fragile States. My name is Nabila Ramdani, and I'm a journalist who was born and brought up in Paris, so I'm particularly honored to be here at a peace forum in my home uh, city. We have three wonderful guests today who are as keen as myself to tackle issues that are crucial uh, to all of us and that indeed affect us all. I'll introduce them uh, to you uh, very shortly. We are, however, uh, we have a depleted uh, panel today, two of our guests, Dr. Franck Bousquet from the World Bank and Niger's uh, planning minister, uh, Aishatou Boulama Kane, are in a fragile situation themselves, so I'm afraid they can't be here with us uh, today. But, uh, and they of course send their uh, apologies and we are very sorry uh, ourselves that they can't be with us. But I can assure you that we are still going to enjoy a very stimulating discussion. Effective uh, government and the need to end wars as a means to sort out problems was at the heart of Pascal Lamy's vision for this Paris Peace Forum. And I really do want to thank Mr. Lamy for his work as president of the executive committee and indeed thank the Aga Khan Foundation for getting me involved. We must not forget President Emmanuel Macron of France either, somebody I was delighted uh, to speak to yesterday when he made his speech here at the Peace Forum. I also spoke to Mr. Macron just before he became head of state in 2017. And peace was at the center of all his discourse. He told me about growing up in the Somme department, a region devastated by two world wars, and how he never wanted to see European neighbors going to war against each other again. Mr. Macron and I um, expect everybody else attending this forum uh, to be an advocate for, du for durable peace and indeed uh, collective um, action against, uh, aimed at preventing um, conflicts. And this is by no means a political point. Uh, we all expect it to disagree with each other on all kinds of issues. It is instead a fundamental point of fact about survival and indeed creating the conditions for us all to flourish. The number one duty of any administration in any state, whether in a mature functioning democracy or indeed in the kind of fragile state that we will be discussing today, is to keep people alive. And that is why forums like this one are crucially important. The Paris Peace Forum was only launched and inaugurated last year. And yet, it immediately drew 65 heads of states and government leaders. They were joined by officials from all walks of life, including from international organizations committed to peace and various religious groups. More than 100 countries were represented in all, so creating our very own United Nations here in Paris. It is also entirely fitting that the event is happening once again around November the 11, which is of course the anniversary of the First World War armistice. As you know, this is an event that happened more than 100 years ago, but it still dominates all of our lives because we never forgot about the absolute destructions that and indeed devastation that war uh, can bring into even advanced 
and seemingly stable societies. Look at the terrible conflicts that are happening as we speak in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Palestine and across the African continent. By fragile states, we are referring to nations that are wrecked by instability and conflict, to places where peace is by no means assured and where the life chances are extremely and severely restricted because of war and all its consequences. And our panel today will consider how exclusion, the exclusion of people from political, social, and economic domains can be addressed through participation. And as they will highlight, fragile environments are not inevitable. And that's why we won't just um, dwell on uh, the horrific situations, but also propose concrete solutions. And it's this kind of project that we will be discussing today. And I'm very delighted that our speakers are, like everybody in the forum in general, from different and indeed from a wide range of uh, backgrounds, uh, different sectors, different regions, and indeed different experiences. And my panelists today are Dr. Well, not. I no, I can't call you doctor, you're not a doctor. <laughs> uh, Christian <laughs> Kramer, who is director of the KFW Development Bank, covering Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. Dr. Najmuddin Najm, who is chief executive officer of the Aga Khan Foundation in Afghanistan. And indeed, Mark Friedrich, who is head of unit at the instrument contributing to stability and peace at the European Commission. So please do give our guests a very warm welcome. Let me now just say a few words about the format uh, of this session. I will uh, get the conversation uh, going by asking questions and inviting uh, panelists uh, to uh, answer. And this will, of course, uh, provoke uh, conversations and indeed exchanges between uh, our speakers. And I would then want to bring as many members of the audience as possible for uh, a discussion. And you'll have a chance to ask questions during our last uh, 15 minutes. I will then conclude the session with some closing remarks. I would also like to remind you that you have translation devices at your disposal and you can uh, use uh, nine for English and 10 for French. Let me start this uh, discussion by providing a bit of context and indeed highlighting uh, the very bleak findings uh, recently uh, published in a report by the World Bank. Um, about what is referred to as FCV, that is to say, fragility, conflict, and violence. The report's key finding is that by 2030, at least half of the world's population, half of the world's poor people, more specifically, will be living in fragile and conflict-affected uh, uh, areas. And there are all kinds of very alarming conflict-related observations in the report, ranging from concerns about enormous numbers of war refugees in the world to gang violence. And more specifically, the report states that there are more violent conflicts than at any time in the past 30 years, that we are currently experiencing the largest forced displacement crisis since the Second World War, that there are high levels of interpersonal and gang violence, and that conflicts are driving 80% of all humanitarian needs, and that today, conflict and violence impact more civilians than any point ever in the last decades. In other words, what is 
called the global fragility landscape is significantly worse. So I'd like to spend some time with my guests today to perhaps highlight um, what the problems are. And I would like to draw on the regional uh, experiences and indeed ex expertise and hear um, about um, your work in specific parts of the world. If I can start with you, uh, Christian, um, your senior director of the KFW International Development Bank, as I said, what do you identify as the main challenges in the troubled parts of the world that you operate in? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, let me just say I'm delighted to be here. It's a pleasure to sit on this panel with those delighted colleagues. And I have to say, since you mentioned President Macron, um, I had the pleasure to listen to his speech yesterday. And I really have to say, being a convinced European, uh, it, is, it was a very inspiring uh, speech, I have to say. And um, that made my day yesterday. But let me come back to your question. Um, and when you ask me about the challenges in the region I'm covering, <coughs> first of all, I think it makes sense to say what we are doing. KFW is a development bank. KF that means it's an implementing agency. What we are doing is taking money from the German budget in order to put it into projects, financing projects in the respective countries. May it be a hospital, may it be a power plant, a hydropower plant, may it be a sanitation system in a city. That means our natural partners in those countries are the respective ministries. So when we are discussing building a power plant, we're discussing with the respective Ministry of Energy. If we are discussing building or repairing uh, destroyed hospitals, we're discussing with the Ministry of Health. That means our natural partners are the institutions in those countries. And it's often said, and um, that's something I really have to say, that's a right point, the main aspect of fragility is weak institutions. And that, for us, is the main challenge when it comes to those countries. And it, if you look at the countries we are covering in my team, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, you would say they're all fragile, which I would agree, but they're very different. And the extent and the ways of fragility is very different. So, if, for example, if you look at Pakistan, a functional democracy, elected a new president, a free press, on the other hand, pressure from religious extremism, pressure from IDPs, pressures from refugees coming from Afghanistan, for example, that's put, that certainly puts a certain pressure on institutions and is weakening them. Then if you look at Afghanistan, a very different scenario. Partly in the country of Afghanistan, we are on the edge of a civil war. And more and more, we are asking ourselves, is that a region we still can build a power plant? Is that a region we still can look at a sanitation system? So really um, discussing certain regions of the country where the institutions lost completely control. And finally, coming to Iraq, another completely different story. If you look at Iraq at the last weeks and you followed the press, there's high pressure from the street. People are discontent with the non-progress of the government coming from a post-conflict situation. So all three countries I would call fragile, but they are very different. And that comes to us when we are discussing what are the challenges and the answers, the solutions we have to find in those countries. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Christian. And if I may come to you now, uh, Najmuddin, and uh, get you perhaps to elaborate on the work you do with the Aga Khan Foundation in Afghanistan. Um, I think it is worth pointing out that His Highness, um, the Aga Khan, who is an Ismaili uh, Muslim leader, but also the founder and chairman of the Aga Khan uh, Development uh, Network, is renowned for his charitable work and contribution to international uh, development, uh, especially in desperately poor nations plagued uh, by war. Afghanistan uh, has been the scene of appalling conflicts um, for centuries, and there is uh, currently no let up. 
um, Western forces continue to support local forces in the fight against uh, insurgents. So perhaps you could say a few words about the deep-seated problems that the Gaaka Khan Foundation is um, dealing with in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, I'm representing the uh, 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 Aga Khan Foundation, which is part of the Aga Khan Development Network, uh, a network which is uh, engaged in social, economic, and cultural development uh, globally. And uh, we have a large presence uh, in the region, and in particular uh, in Afghanistan. The approach that uh, we take to the development in Afghanistan and else elsewhere is uh, a multi-input uh, uh, area development approach uh, through which we believe that there is no uh, single prescription and solution to development issues. You highlighted the challenges that we are facing today and especially in countries that are categorized as fragile. And those issues are complex. They come with a history, and there is a deep background. We believe that to tackle those issues, we cannot go with simple and short-term solutions. And we believe that for those, uh, to, to handle those development issues, you have to have a long-term commitment, and you have to also bear in mind the while the context is complex and issues are complex, you have to also be patient to take a complicated way to address those challenges. Well, uh, specific to Afghanistan, as you said, uh, a country in conflict now for more than four decades, uh, a country with uh, very famous at the global level. It's too difficult to draw a black and white picture of that country I'm sitting here um, after 15 years of work in uh, development era uh, from mountain areas of Afghanistan in the northeast. 15 years ago, this was not possible for the country. There are challenges. We know that there is um, an increasing trend of insecurity in the country. We all know that uh, the country, because of many reasons, are affected by man-made and natural disasters. The impact of the climate change is very obvious in a country like Afghanistan. And we know that there are uh, uh, areas and issues that both government and communities are struggling to uh, come over. But uh, a lot of achievements have also been made in terms of uh, Improvements in education, improvements in health, improvements in infrastructure, improvements in institutional development in the country. We look at both challenges that we are facing, but also opportunities and potentials that exist uh, in Afghanistan and all those uh, regional countries that, uh, that we are active. Uh, the country still has a long way to go and then to have the required capacity, uh, uh, institutional capacity at all levels. The country has a long way to build full confidence around uh, the democracy uh, uh, exists in the country. It has a long way to establish the systems which takes the uh, overall uh, uh, mm, expectations and rule of communities in consideration when it comes to all development processes. And the country has a long way to also uh, come over the issues of insecurity that we have at the moment. Uh, as the network, uh, we uh, tackle issues of uh, 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 multilateral issues of development in the country, starting from uh, education to health, to uh, building the infrastructure, uh, uh, working closely with uh, Afghanistan government ministries, uh, both at the national level, but also at the provincial level, to make sure that the community needs, the citizen needs,
come truly to uh, uh, to the national level, and that's taken uh, taken care uh, in the national development programs. Thank you very much indeed, um, Najmuddin. If we concentrate um, still on, on the problems, Mark, I'd like to bring you in this uh, conversation and uh, draw on your experience and your uh, expertise. Um, I would, before you tell us a bit more about, you know, I promised this audience that we are going to offer her solutions as well. I would like also to hear from you what can be done, um, you know, to tackle the huge burden of uh, fragile states and indeed insecurity. And perhaps if you could tell us more about uh, the role of um, grassroots institutions, local uh, governance and indeed civil society as a whole, and what role can they do or can they play in reducing conflict and indeed achieving peace? Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Nabila. Um, I, I had to make a split uh, second decision this morning to, to join this panel. So uh, excuse me if, if my discourse is not quite as, as fully um, formulated as, as the one of Christian and, and Najmuddin. Um, very, very briefly, I speak from a perspective of, of a, a funding instrument that the European Union has uh, to, to respond to situations of crisis uh, or also of opportunities to, to uh, help prevent conflict or the escalation of conflict, the instrument contributing to stability and peace. Nabila, now to just come back to, to, to some of the challenges that that we see, and I think particularly when you look at the title of this panel, uh, one, one aspect that struck me very much is the issue of the local government's issue. I think we still have a tendency oftentimes when we think of peace processes um, to, to look towards national processes. We, we, we tend to focus on the national actors and we tend to consider that regional or local actors are somehow sort of complementary feeding into larger processes. I think that is a big challenge. That is one issue that we would need to get away from um, we as an international community. Um, I think you mentioned a figure earlier on about um, how many people will be living in fragile states. Uh, there's another figure of about 70% um, of, of the population is going to live in very big cities um, in, I, I believe it's 2025. The, the issue with that is, though, the only thing that I wanted to demonstrate with that is that we tend to focus only on national politicians, national actors. We hardly ever see a peace process with mayors involved. Um, but oftentimes it is with mayors that we would need to undertake uh, these kinds of conversations, and subsequently also with local leaders at community level. So I think there is an issue of perception that, that is, is, is at the heart of, of our difficulties, where we need to um, uh, basically reposition ourselves and start finding ways of engaging better also with local actors. How can we do that? I think Najmuddin has already given some examples of how this is being done. We know very well that once people have no longer got access to education, once they do not see that their children have a possibility to prepare for the future, that is when people decide to leave. We see people staying in conflict zones for a very long period of time, um, oftentimes admirably so, but when they see that their local schools are closing, that the health centers are no longer working, that is when we see that people leave, and that is oftentimes when we start noticing conflicts. And that is too late. Um, the other part that, that attracted me to this session here is, is the part about conflict prevention. We tend to only engage when it's already too late. When, when the tension is already high, when people are already leaving. By undertaking the kinds of investments that the Aga Khan uh, Foundation is undertaking or that the KFW is undertaking or that we at the European Commission are trying to undertake, is we are trying to 
stabilize also local governance through conflict. I think we had a period when it was generally agreed among the international community that when a conflict starts, development is interrupted. I think that is something that we have overcome. Syria is a very good example of this at the moment. There are very many donors, including the European Commission, at the moment trying to maintain local governance structures uh, in those parts of Syria where that is possible. And that is a very shifting game. And it is one where it is impossible to do this through the kind of large-scale programs um, that you can undertake reasonably in peaceful situations, but it is one where one has to be extremely careful of how one works with different communities, how one evaluates also their, their, their political opportunities, their political possibilities and their limits to be able to undertake that kind of work. But if we manage to maintain local governance in these kinds of um, situations, the possibilities for reconciliation and for rebuilding once a conflict comes to an end are much higher and much better. But I want to briefly maybe then also come to the issue of how do we actually undertake conflict prevention and there maybe make a point that is um, not so widely recognized yet. I think for better undertaking conflict prevention, we have to go to the local level. And we have to do this with much better data and with much more fine-grained data, which we ourselves cannot not possibly get. I will speak very honestly about our current efforts at undertaking early warning um, and, and conflict prevention measures. Most of the time, the people who undertake the analysis are people who look like me, um, Western-educated, um, highly academic, um, um, uh, oftentimes more men than women. Um, and we do not necessarily, with, with that we can get very uh, articulate analysis of a country situation, maybe a regional situation, but we do not get the kind of fine-grained analysis that we would need to actually address grievances before they become violent conflicts at local level. Now, how could we get there? I think the only way to get there is by making sure that we have a critical mass of people in rural and urban areas who can detect what are the early signs of violent conflict and how can these best be mitigated before they actually turn into violent conflict. So we would need to have what, say for example, humanitarian actors do on a broad scale already now, collecting data about nutrition deficits, about stunting. We do nothing like that about conflict in local communities. I think we would need to build such networks and to be able to capture where is conflict imminent, where is conflict likely to turn violent, to get better at how do we actually then start addressing it. And I think also there we need to rely much more so on the local skills of, say, students who come from that area, business people, but also local authorities. So with that, I've started going a little bit into uh, what could be the solutions also. Um, but I think, indeed, it is first of all, first and foremost, a perception change of how we start um, perceiving the local and the role of the local in this. I might end with one last part in terms of the solutions. When we talk about peace processes, and we oftentimes uh, criticize and, and we are frustrated by how difficult it is to get those who normally don't get their voice heard around the table. So a perfect example of that would be a few years ago uh, when, when the discussions in Geneva started on the Syria conflict, women had an incredibly difficult time to get a seat at the table. In fact, they did not get a seat at the table in the end. 
However, there was a sort of small caucus formed of women who were advising the then UN special advisor, which when it was set up was considered very much a second best kind of solution, something that was done as a, as a sort of gimmick. So, you know, because they couldn't sit at the real table, they'll get a side table somewhere outside the room. But in fact, the special envoy managed to use this group strategically in a way, and this group mm. has, has, has created for itself an audience outside, or beyond the table, that has become much more important with time, and that has allowed there to be a lot more voice for women, not at the table, but in many other ways that are just as meaningful and just as important. So I think in that sense, we also need to get away from the idea that peace processes only happen around the peace negotiation table. I'll, I'll finish here for the moment. Well, thank you very much indeed for giving us a, a good idea of the principal obstacles to, to peace and stability. Let us carry on uh, little discussions about uh, working out a few realistic uh, solutions. And let me come back to you, first of all, uh, Najmuddin, because the Aga Khan Foundation has uh, produced two important reports uh, this year, one uh, outlined in Berlin, personally by His Highness the Aga Khan, and the other, the other one was launched in, in, in London. And both reports propose solutions to problems preventing stability and effective uh, government in fragile states. Uh, could you speak about these solutions? Thank you. Um, well, I, I'll bring the uh, lessons that we have learned uh, throughout uh, more than two decades of the work that uh, we have done in Afghanistan. And um, I would start with uh, what you, Mark, uh, stated about the rule of local communities' engagement. One of the main lessons that we have learned is that you have to be closer to people. You have to make sure that uh, local communities, local institutions, and local stakeholders, they are aware and then they own the concepts of development. We have also learned that uh, communities, they can play an important role in any changing trend in the country. If you remember 2014, that is the year uh, where the drawdown of the international forces from Afghanistan started. And uh, with that, there was also a decrease at an international level to commitments to Afghanistan. While we know the impact of those forces in supporting the Afghanistan government and the whole international commitment to the country, but one fact that was not coming to the surface as, as we were listening and e as we were watching more about the military interventions was the impact that the decrease of the commitment to Afghanistan was making on the local communities. And as you rightly mentioned, Mark, when people see that the space is shrinking for investment in education, in health, in infrastructure, in economic development, that is something that creates the factor of fear within communities. We have to bear in mind that we should not underestimate the power of hope and the danger of fear and hopelessness. Thousands of people left Afghanistan and then they became refugees in Europe in many parts of the world. It was not only because they were afraid of only insecurity. That country and the community in Afghanistan, they have the resilience of dealing with conflicts for the last 50 years. What was concerning for people was saying that they will not be as much engaged, they will not be as much supported as they were by the international community. My message from that point is that we should not leave those areas. We should not leave the attention. As I said in the beginning, it's a long-term work, and we have to make sure that that's continuing. The other lesson that we have learned 
uh, 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 in our work is creating the ownership. You have to make sure that you take communities, you take the stakeholders at all levels of your work. They will provide the protection for the development work. They will provide the protection for, the, for their own future. Uh, and, and we have examples of the collaborations that we have with German government in KFW in Afghanistan. And I'm sure that Christian will talk about it. Uh, lastly, I think, as I said, uh, it has to be holistic. You cannot claim making a change in the life of communities by one intervention. You have to make sure that you, you have a holistic approach to those development issues. In the reports that you have referred, one of those reports talk about the regional cooperation. The successful model of uh, uh, cross-border interventions that we have done. And we have seen that as a complementary work to the development efforts that we do in the country. So the regional potentials, the regional capacities, and the way that the regional countries can help each other to overcome the issues is one of the other lessons that we learned as the Agahan Development Network in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Please feel free, Christian, to come in and compliment what Najmuddin has just said, um, especially, as he mentioned, uh, some cooperative work between your two organizations. Yes, uh, thank you. And let me give you a concrete example um, of the cooperation between Aga Khan and KFW that really goes into the subject of local community stabilization. Um, ten years ago, we introduced the North Afghanistan Stabilization um, Program. Um, and um, we were asking ourselves, what are the right partners to implement small infrastructure projects in northern Afghanistan? I said at the beginning, we're dealing with weak institutions. Um, we, we came to the conclusion that central government is not the right partner, since um, there's only a limited capacity and we wanted to deal with a more district level. So we were looking at partners that are well connected, well rooted in the districts of northern Afghanistan. And we found three NGOs that are, and the main uh, uh, NGO is Haga Khan. And um, we did a concept of involving the local communities by establishing district development agent, um, assemblies. It's those assemblies that decide which project is done and which not. So they get a variety of offers, and then they are ready to decide, in our district, this school is much more important than maybe this other um, health institution or whatever other project. So a clear contribu contribution, a clear commitment from the local government that establish some kind of um, identification with all the projects. And um, I'm an infrastructure guy, so I want to build infrastructure, and more important, I want to last. I want, I want that it, it stays there for a very long time, that people get the favor from it, and I want it to be maintained. That's also very important. It's not only to have something built in a certain time frame, in a certain cost frame, but we want those projects to last for a very long time. And so, for me, another success factor of this program is that we also installed committees of maintenance, where people from the local communities take the responsibility to maintain certain projects in order to have them for a very long time. So, finding a partner that is deeply rooted in the local community, um, for example, Aga Khan, and finding together with those deeply rooted partners a system of including the local people. For me, that is the main success factor for this program that lasts now for 10 years, and we will postpone it for another period since it's working very well. Well, you've mentioned the absolute, absolutely crucial necessity for long-term solutions, and indeed you um, use the word stabilization. Now, stabilization is, of course, essential to sus sustaining, um, for sustaining durable peace in a state. And, but what I'd like to know is what is usually understood 
by stabilization as a concept and how can we measure stabilization what are its indicators, if you like? And I'd like to ask all of you um, this question, and that would be my final questions before bringing in the audience. Well, um, when we talk about the stabilization, I think a big, a big picture will come, that a country will be peaceful. I think that's the outcome. We have to make sure that we stabilize the processes. We stabilize the institutions. We have to make sure that we monitor the trajectories of change in a context. From our learnings, the way that you work with uh, local institutions or stakeholders, the way that you oversee the evolution of those institutions, that how they adapt to the changing context is really, really important. In context that we are talking about, things will change. There is always chance of a conflict. There is always chance of a major uh, shock to communities. How you build that resilience, how you build that power of adaptability within the local institution for us is the precursor of the stability in the country. The other point that I will, uh, I will add and I will give the floor to my colleagues here is that we have to also change our narrative. When we talk, when we say fragile countries, that gives a perception in the world and in the communities. Let's rephrase it. And we have to make sure that we have to be positive about it. Let's look at the potentials, the capacities that are there, the opportunities that exist in those countries. I think the time has come that we have to emphasize on those areas, on those positive aspects of those countries ca that can be the enabler for change, the enabler for harmony, and the enabler for uh, overall development in those countries. And it's important that you value the diversity and the, um, the importance of uh, your work uh, to promote pluralism in those contexts. Mark, you might have something to say about this as well. Yes, sure. Um, I think stabilization is is a term that that means very different things to different people. If if you live in a context where um, you do not dare send your children to school anymore because they can't get there safely, um, where your own family has been directly affected by violence. Um, stabilization is probably an aspiration simply in terms of there being an absence of violence and there being some degree of institutionality uh, recovered. Now, if you, on the other hand, live in a context where um, things are woefully stable and you are living under a repressive regime and you are having to basically um, swallow that you cannot express your opinions, then stability is probably a fairly negative term to you. So in that sense, I think stability is, is a difficult term. Um, and you asked about what's the indicator as to when have we got stability. Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's plenty of expert discussions on it, but the one that I find most compelling is when you simply look at when people stop talking about instability. If you notice that, uh, you know, the, the difficulties that are being talked about are no longer about basic things such as the ones that I just mentioned before, killings, uh, uh, torture, um, then uh, I think that's probably the best indicator of there being some degree of stability. But I would also say that stability in and by itself is not a value or a virtue as such. It always has to go with other things such as peace. Is that something you would agree with, Christian? Yes, especially the last point. For our work, I mean, a lot of good things have been said already uh, when it comes to stabilization, and I would agree it's a, it's a big word, and uh, you would find a lot of different definitions. But in our work, it's always important when we look at, for example, a post-conflict country, when we're dealing with urgent needs 
food, water, dealing with refugees or IDPs, we always have to think about the next phase, about the phase after the urgent stabilization when it comes to financing, fulfilling the basic needs of institutions, of, of people, yeah, rebuilding infrastructure, for example. So to think it right from the start as a concept and not just stepping into stabilization now and then, yeah, what, what we're doing next? So starting as a concept right from the start. Well, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, for your valuable insights so far. And it, it, it's been a, a very uh, a fascinating discussion so far. And I would like now to get everybody else involved and open up the session to questions. So please feel free to ask whatever you want and uh, make sure to state your name, your organization, uh, before your question. Uh, can I go to the gentleman in the first row first and then the lady here? Yes, good morning. My name is Mr. Mamadi Diakite, and I'm the UNAID Special Advisor for Security, Humanitarian, and Fragile Countries, overseeing that mandate globally. I was extremely delighted when I heard the panelists pinpointing through issues, and I think the critical one that we've been observing so far was the lack of factual data. And I want to quote you, Nabila, as of today, I think we've got more than 1.5 billion of people living in fragile countries. And for us, dealing with the health pandemic, we've even were able to count something like 2.6 million of those one affected by fragility are also HIV positive, which means one out of 14, you know. And through that figure, we have a very disturbing factor, which is also pertaining to sexual violence in conflict, you know. More than 2,500 cases, you know, on an annual basis. These are critical areas for which we have to carefully tackle. The need to carefully generate very sound and factual data in order to carefully address the issue. But I think that, I mean, out of the overall notions of fragility, there is one aspect which is to be also very much important to sustain the resilience, not only countries, but communities being affected. And I think this is where we have to gradually be more strategic in our future thinking in generating a lot of, you know, package of services that can gradually create a lot of, you know, sustainable uh, problem in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a very powerful statement. Um, could I uh, now go to this lady in the front and take a question from her? Hi, um, I'm speaking for Rana, who is the co-founder of the NGO Humanity Diaspo. Um, sorry, so um, it was mentioned that humanitarians that act in, the, uh, in local uh, areas had to share data on the local needs like hunger, thirst, insecurity to prevent the risks of conflict. Um, these people al already do it through advocacy addressed to international institutions like the UN, NATO, the governments, um, and sorry, and it is the place of humanitarian aid and people involved in humanitarian aid to do no harm. It is also the role of the state and of the government to provide these basic needs, uh, but in conflict situations, the governance is so fragile that it is uh, that the international NGOs that provide all of these services like water sanitation, security in the camps, education. So how can you guarantee the security of these actors if you want them to raise the alarm without threatening the trust um, that the beneficiaries of these actions have in them? Like when knowing that this, tr this trust that local people put in the NGOs is the basis for their action um, and their interaction with these populations. So it's almost as if the roles are reversed. Um, the jobs that are supposed to be done by the police, the military, the governments are done by, by these NGOs. So what guarantee do you give to the people that are involved in these humanitarian actions? And sorry, and another question was, sorry. Um, in conflict situations, women, um, women have strong qualities of leadership. For example, um, when their husbands are fighting or dead, they're the ones who organize. 
uh, the management in, in areas for food, for water, for security, for education of the kids. So how can you guarantee th um, that these women have a place to the table of negotiations um, without waiting for them to ask this place that is also theirs? Um, it's not possible to continue taking decisions for them without them. You would like to say something, uh, Najmudina? I think, yes. Mark, you um, also uh, highlighted the role of women uh, earlier on, so might, you might want to dwell on this. Well, to the question that how you ensure uh, the safety and security of your beneficiaries and also the aid workers and stakeholders, uh, for us, acceptance is the main concept. You have to make sure that the interventions that uh, you're doing in the ground is understood, and as I said, it's owned by communities. In 2004, we started the first, the first batch of the community midwifery education program. And an example is that in, uh, in eight border districts with Tajikistan, because of the lack of the human professionals, we had to recruit 24 midwives from Tajikistan to serve in Afghanistan border districts. To overcome that challenge, we, with the support of uh, international uh, donors, we started the Community Midwifery Education Program. In 2004, we were struggling to get girls from four villages to come to the provincial capital, stay there for 18 months and get that education. Because people were saying that, first of all, this is an imported idea, this is done by an international organization, we don't know what will happen to the privacy, a lot of questions. This was 2004. We had to knock doors of communities to say, can you send your daughters to this course? In 2010, we had to launch an exam because the number of applicants from the districts were more than the needs in the health facilities. Why that happened? Because of the trust. When they came, when they were enrolled, when a woman went back to the village and she was treated as a professional, made a difference. So the underlying concept is that creating that acceptance and uh, uh, creating that ownership at the community level. Thanks, I'm, I might just come back to, to the two points. I mean, the, uh, Ms. Ms. Ndiakite mentioned the, the issue of data and it was, it was picked up also in the question uh, about how far should humanitarians be involved and what kind of protection do they then have in that situation. Maybe just to briefly reiterate, my, my, my point earlier was really more so to say that I get a sense that in many uh, conflict situations, humanitarian actors are collecting a lot of data that inform their programming. Um, and that's, that's sort of an accepted norm in the humanitarian world. Which is, which is good and necessary to make sure that we use the very scarce humanitarian funds in, in the best possible way. I'm afraid we don't have that same rigor when it comes to trying to address peace building and conflict prevention. So just, just to be clear, I don't necessarily mean by that that humanitarians should provide that data. I'm, I'm also saying that it is probably necessary for peace builders to take a little bit more of an example from what the humanitarian actors are doing and to become a little bit more empirical and that's particularly necessary if we want to work in peace building more effectively at the local level because we are being far too anecdotal a lot of the time and we oftentimes pay a very high price for that. Um, if we were able, say for example, Mr. Djerkite mentioned uh, the issue of domestic violence. If we were able to understand better that because there oftentimes is a link between domestic violence and more broadly violence, then we could use data of that kind to see where is it likely that we may have either an increase in domestic violence or an increase in communal violence, and hopefully try and do something about it before that breaks out. So 
that's, that's just to clarify a little bit my point about peace building and data, where um, I, I feel strongly that we, we are at the very beginning of what we would need to achieve in order to be able to do, to sustain peace more successfully. The second point about um, uh, how, how to, how to, uh, and, and sorry, maybe just to say also, you, you were asking about so the, the kinds of guarantees that, that we, we can provide. I think, I think the, the unfortunate answer to that is, is that in, in most fragile situations, very little guarantees can be provided by anyone. Um, so the, the only kind of, uh, I think guarantees is probably the wrong word to use. What we can do as, as, as an international community is to try and show solidarity. So if there are people who are brave enough in situations where this can put their life in danger to engage in undertaking community services in situations of violence, what we try to do before we provide funding is to make sure that indeed they are aware of the risks that they are taking and that they take those risks consciously and that we try and help them minimize the risks. And I think that is the best that we can do and I fully agree with the point that you are making that of course under normal circumstances the, the, the responsibility for security needs to be with the state institutions and not necessarily with civilian community actors. But in the situations that we're talking about, that is, that is not what we have. So we see in, in a lot of contexts, be it Syria, be it Libya, um, but also be it places like the Central African Republic, where communities self-organize to try and ensure security and that can be done in a way that is sort of trying to establish a dialogue with the authorities. It, it is also sometimes done in a more clandestine way by arming themselves and having sort of armed self-defense groups. What we as international community can try and do is promote more of the former and try and discourage the latter. I see that a lot of the time, particularly when it comes to uh, negotiations with local negotiations with um, security actors, women take a very important role. We need to be able to, but oftentimes we don't recognize that very easily. Therefore, as international community, for us to be able to do that better is we need to, we need to have sort of the the step ladder of um, our contacts with European or international civil society, national civil society, local civil society, down to such a, such a fine-grained step ladder that we can actually intervene at that level and make sure that those women or, and men who are able to undertake those kinds of initiative at local level are identified and supported. Mm. We're not very good at that yet. Thank I'm you. Not sure I've answered your question, mm. but um, I've tried. We, we have time for two <coughs> very brief uh, questions and very brief answers as well. Uh, let me, because uh, I have um, noticed this lady in the first um, row and the gentleman in the beige jacket as well. Hi, uh, my name is Liliane Moubdiei, and I work for uh, Avocats Sans Frontières, um, Lawyers Without Borders in English. Um, I have a question that are, that are related to the, the role of uh, local actors, uh, the involvement that you all mentioned that is important to work with these actors. And uh, we all, I mean, I all um, I agree with that, uh, with that statement that it's important to work with the local communities, local actors. However, what we observe in uh, uh, our countries of intervention is that some uh, international institutions are reluctant, reluctant to work with, this, uh, with traditional authorities. 
in the sense that some of them don't uh, work as formal institution. And um, I would like to know how do you think we should reconcile this, uh, uh, this different, I mean, this discourse of it's important to work with the local actors, but at the same time to work with the, these traditional authorities that are uh, that are benefit of trust from communities that are very close to communities and uh, who also really understand some of their uh, realities and, uh, and can be um, uh, important actors in preventing and resolving conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the uh, next question at the same time, please. Bonjour, je m'appelle Amadou Ouliba. Je suis euh, membre du Front euh, National pour la Défense de la Constitution en Guinée. Je vis au Sénégal, je suis étudiant et auto-entrepreneur. Ma question s'adresse euh, à monsieur, à docteur Marc, euh, et puis elle est particulière. Euh, Aujourd'hui en Guinée, nous sommes en face d'un gouvernement qui a projet de modifier la Constitution en vue de promouvoir un troisième mandat ou bien euh, une gouvernance à vie. Alors, euh, Monsieur le Président de la République, Alpha Condé, euh, il est à son second et dernier mandat. Normalement, la Constitution en vigueur ne lui permet pas euh, de modifier la Constitution, mais il euh, s'entête à le faire. Et en Guinée, aujourd'hui, il y a des séries de manifestations organisées par euh, cette organisation, l'OFNDC, dont je fais euh, partie, et il y a des morts, et c'est déplorable. Et donc, euh, l'Union européenne, euh, dans sa politique de prévention des conflits ou des crises euh, éventuelles dans les pays euh, du Sud, notamment en Guinée, je voudrais savoir quelle est la position officielle de l'Union européenne par rapport à cette situation qui prévaut euh, dans mon pays en Guinée, et éventuellement, euh, quelles sont les mesures que l'Union européenne euh, prendrait à, en vue d'éviter un, une crise euh, encore euh, dans mon pays Merci. Deux très brefs réponses, si nous pouvons. Peut-être que je reviens à votre question. J'ai décrit le système des agences de district development agencies in our program, and um, I th your, your question is very valid. The answer, maybe you can um, add, um, the answers we tried to find was to combine these, these local people organized in these district uh, development uh, assemblies with some education when it comes to gender, when it comes to uh, vision. district visioning, exactly. So to, to, f to combine um, this level of decision with some educational factors? Absolutely. Well, I think if I stick to that example, one of the issues that we were facing at the provincial level was that there was always an annual uh, uh, provincial development plan developed. But how the priorities at the district level were chosen was a big question. So what we did, that through the collaborations that we had, both at the provincial level and at the district level, we engaged district level and provincial authorities with communities to sit together and to get some capacity building uh, uh, interventions, including, as you said, the district visioning, the prioritization process, and to uh, also uh, uh, trainings on conflict resolution and uh, trainings on common property resources management and operations. So communities will identify those projects. The authorities will endorse that at their district level. And as part of the local government, those projects would become part of the provincial development plan. I completely agree with you that you should not lose one or the other side of the equation. You have to make sure that the work that you do at the local level is always supporting the penetration of a legitimate state into those local areas. Maybe very briefly, I will start also with a question on, on how do we engage with traditional um, leaders. I think um, there, there can be an, an institutional bias. I mean, all of us here on the panel uh, represent institutions that are 
set up according to certain structures, according to certain values, and for us, oftentimes, um, a sort of a, a, a spiritual leader in um, northern Nigeria may not speak in the terms that we can understand, may not share the same values. So I think there can sometimes be a, a bias from our side that stops us from engaging, simply because it is something, it is, it is a, an unknown entity. That I think we need to become much more dispassionate about and we need to start looking at who are the actual leaders in uh, communities and, and how far are their values really as we preconceive them? And, and even if there are some that we might not share, there might be others that we do share and where we should work together. I'll give you one example. We have recently undertaken uh, some training of traditional leaders in northern Nigeria um, on how to use Facebook and how to use um, so sort of social media to communicate with youngsters, simply because we noticed and we, we were told by uh, local civil society organizations that there was an intergenerational conflict and that the traditional leaders had a key part in this and that they did not know how to communicate with, with youth in their own constituencies. So this was something where we, f we were able to, to find a way of doing that, and I think we need to do more of that. I will very briefly then come to um, the gentleman from, from Guinea. I, I, I'm afraid I can't, I can't give you the uh, official um, uh, position of the EU on Guinea at the moment. I'm not, I'm not working on Guinea specifically. Um, what, what we normally try to do in situations where there is a tension is to make sure that, that our delegations have a regular dialogue with all of the partners involved and looking to, 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 to push into a direction um, that, that is respectful of human rights and respectful of the constitution of the country. But perhaps to say more globally, I think that in a lot more conflicts, what we are seeing is that um, what the position of the European Union or the position of the United States or the position of any of the uh, large uh, governments is, is increasingly becoming less relevant to how conflicts pan out at the local level. So what we would need to invest in more so is, for example, we are looking to undertake a, a project with um, not only but also African universities and students' unions to try and make sure that we build enough critical mass of people who have an understanding of what conflict sensitivity is and how peace building and conflict mediation can be carried forward. Because in the end, it is those people who can make a difference, much more so than even an experienced diplomat sitting in Conakry uh, and trying to understand what, what the situation in the country there is at the moment. So I think it is in those ways that we may be able to be helpful rather than um, in, in, in the statements that we can make. We also need to make those, so they have their place. Um, but it is not, it's not the only and perhaps not always the most pertinent way of addressing conflict. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, believe it or not, we're already out of time and uh, this always happens far too quickly uh, when a discussion is um, so informative and indeed so uh, lively. We've all certainly learned some facts, important facts about local governance and indeed conflict prevention and of course how massively complicated solutions are. And I hope we can all agree that this has been a very valuable contribution to the second Paris Peace Forum. And I would like to thank all of our panelists and indeed all the partners involved. And finally, may I also sincerely thank the audience for supporting us and indeed contributing to this event. Thank you all.